Southeast Asians and most members of the Global South are used to multipolarity. We've learned to basically embrace whatever externality, whoever externality that's come upon us and still entail peace and stability. Uh, I want to thank, of course, my dear friend, Pa Desra, His Excellency Pa Desra, the ambassador to the UK from Indonesia, and of course, Pauline and Mark and Catherine. I, I saw Catherine earlier. Ah, oh, there, there she is. And Bagus, who's, you know, our ambassador of goodwill uh, for both Nottingham and Indonesia. <clears throat> Bagus has been spending a lot of time promoting Nottingham uh, to a lot of Indonesians and has been promoting, you know, both ways, uh, as a result of which I've, you know, decided to accept uh, this offer to become an honorary professor at Nottingham University. I'm going to talk about three paradoxes this morning. Uh, the first one is really the, the paradox of the internet, which was discovered several decades ago. And it was allegedly for purposes of equalizing humanity, for purposes of democratizing lots of things. Did a hell of a good job in democratizing information. Nonetheless, it did not do as good a job in democratizing ideas. Uh, even to the extent that ideas were democratized, many of these great ideas uh, were not able to attach themselves to capital, call it money, as a result of which these ideas did not become executable like we've seen in some areas of the world, in many parts of the world. This irony has resulted in some sort of elitization of the economic order uh, of the world in the last few decades. And this is quite paradoxical because we would have hoped a few decades ago that the internet was supposed to be the equalizer, the leveler, but it didn't. At least that's how I see it. The second paradox is really the paradox of sustainability. I'm at the moment spending time at Stanford University. Uh, I guess lecture there, I research there, and I spend a lot of time with people of expertise in the area of sustainability. They sound great, but personally, I feel they're a little too elitist. They see the world as one where they think they're going to be able to attain carbon neutrality by 2050 with no sense of realism of what's really happening on the ground to the extent that it resonates to probably about 10 to 15 percent of the population of the planet, while the remaining 80 to 85 percent are still more worried about putting food on the table. And to give you a concrete il illustration, countries like India and Indonesia, which have power generation capabilities of about 416,000 megawatts and 75,000 megawatts respectively, India can probably produce about 19,000 megawatts a power generation capability per year. Indonesia, about 3,000 megawatts per year. They're both electrified to the extent of about 1,300 kilowatt hour per capita. Key is, in order to be able to understand this narrative of sustainability, you have to be modern. You have to be able to think in a modern way. And in order to attain modernity, you probably have to be electrified to the extent of about 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita. So you start calculating how long it's going to take for countries like India and Indonesia to reach 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita from 1,300 kilowatt hour per capita by way of their respective production capabilities at 19,000 megawatts per year and 3,000 megawatts per year. It's going to take both countries about 100 years. 
which is way beyond the 2050, which is way beyond a 27 year period that we have from now until then. And at some point you gotta figure out how are you gonna be able to accelerate that process? How are you gonna be able to remedy the irreconcilable nature between the narrative of sustainability and the narrative of development? If you take a look at the, the whole planet, it's electrified to the extent of about eight terawatt. And if you make reference to pundits who have certain views about what the planet ought to be electrified at optimally, it should be at about 15 to 16 terawatt. Right? Then you start trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to build the additional seven or eight and to rebuild the pre-existing eight because most of which is really carbon emitting. At a rate of about two to three million dollars on a per megawatt basis, we're gonna need about 30 to 40 trillion dollars. Just think about that. For the planet to be sustainable by way of having power generation capabilities that are renewable, at some point in the future, until then, we're gonna to have to spend 30 to $40 trillion worth. And I don't see that as a point of contention for most members of the planet, with the exception of the G7 countries, which have all the tremendous liquidity, right? If you take a look at the liquidity around the world, there's about 100 to $120 trillion worth of liquidity. Most of that is probably sitting in G7 countries, right? And let's not forget, until 20 months ago, most of that was sitting in a near zero interest rate environment. It wasn't allocated to other parts of the world. It was just circling within and among themselves, a near zero interest rate environment where other parts of the world were living with a much higher interest rate environment. So at some point, you got to take a look at how you're going to be able to remedy this thing. In order to remedy this thing, there is a supply side of the equ equation and there's a demand side of the equation. The demand side, I think it's quite easy. You know, I always joke, if you take a look at the followership of Kylie Jenner, it's close to 400 million, whereas the followership of Greta Thunberg, it's about 15 million. Right there, you know the pulse of the millennials and the zillennials. They like carbon emission. They don't like anything that's not carbon emitting, right? But I can socially re-architect, socially re-engineer somebody's behavior as to stop emitting carbon today. As long as the alternatives are affordable. That applies to a villager in East Java, a villager in Nairobi, a villager in La Lagos or Abuja, and a villager in Central America, as long as the alternatives are affordable. How do you determine affordability? Not easy. Not easy in the sense that it's not easy to attain because to determine affordability, it has to be at about three to five cents per kilowatt. All the available alternative energy mechanisms, call it nuclear, water, hydro, geothermal, they're at about 15 to 20 cents per kilowatt. That's the reason why coal is so popular, because it is five cents per kilowatt. That's why the Indians love coal, the Indonesians love coal, the Nigerians love coal, everybody else loves coal, and let's not forget the Europeans love coal quite some time ago, right? So that's the paradox of sustainability. The third is the paradox of artificial intelligence. I'm spending a lot of time with people of AI background in Silicon Valley. I think they're great, but there is a bit of what I call technological hubris, right? These technologists, they seem to think that they know everything, but they're not involving people of different backgrounds people of culture, people of spirituality, philosophy, environment, economics, and all that good stuff. To the extent that the discourse is not being pushed forward, 
in an adequately multidisciplinary manner. Consequently, potentially, you're going to end up with a product that has not been pushed in a multidisciplinary way. That's not going to be as benign as you might want. That's not going to have the ability to go through that hallucination in a judicious manner. AI is really a hallucination, right? It's the kind of hallucination that's affected by hypnosis, supposedly from people from different backgrounds. But to the extent that it's hypnotized by only one person with one background as opposed to people from different backgrounds, then there is a real risk of this not becoming as benign as you would want it to be. You can see it, some symptoms of what I'm talking about by way of open AI switching from open source to closed source, from not for profit to for profit. So this is quite paradoxical. And if you think that AI is a software exercise or a programming exercise, if you really think about it, it's actually an engineering exercise. And when you start hearing the word engineering, you start thinking scale. When you start thinking scale, you start thinking of whoever can afford it more <coughs> will be in a better position, right? So at the end of the day, it's the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Salesforces of the world, the Metas of the world, the Microsofts of the world that can afford it because they got billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions, and not trillions. Whereas the rest of the world, they can't afford it. So this may end up as elitizing as what we might have seen <coughs> in the context of the internet. So these three paradoxical observations with regards to internet, with regards to sustainability, with regards to AI are <clears throat> what I see as observations that really have and will continue to shape the narrative of humanity going forward. So that's the first stuff they want to talk about. The second is really the obvious, right? Ever since the end of the World War, <clears throat> we saw the world order dominated by two great forces, USSR and the United States, until about 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell off. Then we started seeing what we call the era of unipolarity. So we shifted from the era of bipolarity to the era of unipolarity when there was only one guy that was telling everybody else what to do. That was the United States telling Indonesia what to do, telling the UK what to do, telling the Indians what to do, telling the Nigerians what to do, the Mexicans, Canadians, and all that good stuff what to do. And that was the beginning of a very robust era of multilateralization, right? So if you really think about it, multilateralization actually became very robust at a time when it was unipolar. But then came 2001, when China was accepted to the WTO. Then also 2001 was the time when the United States entered the war in Iraq on the basis of the alleged weapons of mass destruction. The US got distracted. China got onto the world stage of economic wisdom and they were able to show a certain degree of revisionism as with the Indians, as with the other members of the BRICS, as with the other middle powers, call it Turkey, Mexico, Nigeria, Indonesia. This sort of revisionism culminated in the beginning of the era of multipolarity, maybe about 10 years ago. And I kind of went through that because when I was in the government, I was supposed to be running the trade portfolio, and I found it very, very difficult to multilateralize, right? So there is an irony here 
with respect to the era of unipolarity. When the world order becomes unipolar, it actually becomes more difficult to multilateralize. Multipolarity does not translate into multilateral, you know, situation or wisdom. So as it became more difficult, nobody was honoring the WTO rulings as much as effectively, as efficiently as it used to be by way of this revisionist tendencies from the middle powers. So we saw a higher tendency of bilateralization, plurilateralization. The key with doing well in a bilateral setting or a plurilateral setting is really marginal productivity. If you're stuck in a room of 199 people or countries, you go with a multilateral framework with the principle of single undertaking, you can leverage off the strength of one guy to settle a deal with the other guy in the room, right? That's the beauty of multilateralism. But with bilateralism, you're stuck in a room with just one guy or one girl. Rest assured, it's the person that has the higher marginal productivity that's going to win out. The guy with less marginal productivity is the person that's going to lose out, right? So let me put that in the context of Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is a grouping of about 10 economies or 10 countries. The LeBron James of Southeast Asia is Singapore, right? They've got a marginal productivity of about $200,000. That's the ability of every Singaporean to produce goods and services in a single year, $200,000 worth. Indonesia's marginal productivity is $25,000. Most other Southeast Asian countries are below $60,000, right? So in any given situation where any member of Southeast Asia needs to bilateralize with anybody around the world, he or she is exposed if the other guy's mar marginal productivity is higher than $60,000, much less above $100,000 much less above $150,000. So that's the reality that we got to face. Does that mean or does that vote for deglobalization? Not so sure. So if you take a look at the global trade to the global GDP ratio for the last 10 years, it really hasn't dwindled. It's been hovering at slightly over 40%, which is a good sign. As much as the rhetoric, as much as many of the observations that make you think that the world is about to deglobalize because of this higher tendency of bilateralization or plurilateralization, people are still willing to trade with each other in terms of goods and services. And we're yet to see how trade is going to be affected by the trade of data, right? That has not been captured effectively and efficiently as we would have. So we're seeing this multipolarity as an era that's made it very difficult to multilateralize. But the onus now is upon all of us that have low marginal productivity. And I speak on behalf of Indonesia, and I speak on behalf of most countries in Southeast Asia, and I speak on behalf of most members of the developing world most members of the middle powers, because our marginal productivity is still relatively very low. Now, here's another catch about multipolarity. People ask me as to whether or not Southeast Asians are going to be able to embrace multipolarity well. I would argue that we would. We would by way of experience. Right? If you take a look at the last 2,000 years worth of history for Southeast Asia, you know, we've been pretty cool. We've been grazed by Buddhism for 400 years, Hinduism for 600 years, colonization, Islam, Christianity, independence, democratization for the subsequent 700 years, with relatively very, very low bloodshed for the whole of Southeast Asia. If you take a look at the amount or number of lives lost by way of differences of views with regards to ethnicity, race, or religion, no more than 9 million lives lost. 
By the way, three million of which were lost during the Vietnam War. And we all know who the culprit was. So you compare that with the number of lives lost in Europe in the same period of 2,000 years. We're talking about 190 million here. So I would make the argument that Southeast Asians and most members of the Global South are used to multipolarity. We've learned to basically embrace whatever externality, whoever externality that's come upon us and still entail peace and stability. This is why I've been arguing that Southeast Asia is a great place for economic prosperity because the precondition for any kind of economic prosperity is peace and stability. Now, we compare that with the United States. I would make the argument that the United States is actually finding it very difficult to embrace multipolarity. Right? And it's manifested in how they're dealing with China and how they're dealing with other parts of the world. And, and I see this from an economic standpoint as something where I think the United States will come to a recognition that they're going to have to probably learn a little bit from some, some of us in the global south. Winning the peace is far more important than winning the war. Vietnam was a place where they lost the war, but they won the peace. I would make the argument that Vietnam right now is one of the most ardent supporters of the United States, whether it's in the context of containing China or just for free trade purposes, for free economic collaboration purposes. Vietnam would be out there on the first row to speak on behalf of and in support of the United States. I'm not seeing the United States having been able to win the peace in other parts of the world, as well as they did in Vietnam. But there is an economic limitation here. We take a look at the debt to GDP ratio of the United States. They're running at a debt of about $33.5 trillion on a back of GDP of about $26 trillion. So that's about 140% debt to GDP ratio. You know how much they've been spending in the last 20 years on wars in the Middle East? Anybody know how much the United States has spent? A lot. Definitely buys a lot of muffins. <clears throat> About $14 trillion. So if you take out those $14 trillion from the $33.5 trillion, the United States would be not only the biggest economy in the world, but would be the most healthy economy in the world, right? They could fix those really poor infrastructure in New York and San Francisco. They could definitely fix the healthcare system. They could definitely fix a lot of things that are problematic in the U.S. right now but they're not being fixed because of the economic limitations. And I was having this discussion about what's gonna happen in some of the you know, troubled areas that the United States has been involved. Look, I, we, can, we can have an argument about ideology, we can have an argument about whatever, but the economics is obvious, right? Since 20 months ago, the interest rate has been jacked up by more than 2,000%, from 0.25% to more than 5%. Just think about that. Think about how that would have had an impact, relatively speaking, to any economy. Think about any economy that would have had to go through the rise of the interest rate relatively by 2,000% in 20 months. It's a huge shock, right? And that's something that's not sustainable or tenable, right? So I think at some point they're going to come to the recognition that they're not going to be able to continue doing whatever they've been doing, you know, recklessly or wisely. At the end of the day, the economics matters. So in conclusion, I would make the argument that the United States 
would have to learn a little bit from the middle power countries about embracing multipolarity. I think multipolarity is going to be with us for at least the near foreseeable future. It could be for the medium future. Because I don't see polarization of conversations ending anytime soon. At the rate that conversations are going to continue being polarized, I think things are going to continue being multipolarized. At the rate that things are going to continue being multipolarized, multilateralization is at risk. At the rate that multilateralization is at risk, then somebody's going to have to figure out how to fix all these things. China, that's the last piece. People would ask me as to whether or not China would be good at embracing multipolarity. I would make the case that China has spent thousands of years to consolidate its ethnicity into Han at 92 to 93%, right? Their homogeneity is such that they've learned it's very precious to maintain. And they're not going to do anything silly to destroy that, right? And I could speak for the relations between China and Southeast Asia in the last 2,000 years. It's been mainly commercial. It hasn't been militaristic <laughs> to the extent that people might imagine. It has been, to, the, to some extent, cultural. When we had scholars coming by through South Sumatra, when they were on the way to Nalanda in India, you know, during the early, you know, first millennium, second part of the first millennium. And in the second millennium, the Chinese came by. It became a little bit militaristic, but it was within manageability in the eastern parts of Java, when at that time it was actually under the Yuan dynasty. And at that time, it was the early part of the Majapahit kingdom. But those are skirmishes that are within manageability. But China has always learned that the world was, is, and is always likely to be multipolar. And I think they're going to abide by the rules a bit better than what I can say for the United States at the moment. So at the end, the world is going to stay afloat if we all learn how to win the peace, not win the war. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, you use ChatGPT. Yeah. I mean, the early version of ChatGPT versus the current version, I think reflect deficiencies that are clearly correlated with the absence of, you know, the involvement of other disciplines. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, mention the exact questions that I would have asked Chad GPT, but it, it, it related to a certain morality type of question. And it's related to, you know, another question was, you know, related to, you know, a certain philosophical you know, scenario, and it was just very clear that it answered the question in ways that reflected that deficiency. Uh, is that going to change for the better? I think it will if we continue talking about this, right? Uh, it is an evolution of things, uh, but I can tell you. A lot of the people that I meet in Silicon Valley, they don't think very highly of many of these other disciplines because, you know, rightfully, if you talk to these, you know, smart STEM people, they think they're the smartest, right? Um, they think they're smarter than you. Uh, they don't need to take into account whatever, you know, you have something to, you know, whether you have something to offer. Uh, and let's not forget that a lot of these are profit chasing entities, right? And they're actually being monitored, evaluated on a quarterly basis by the public or the, by the shareholders. To me, that's not bad, 
right? The chase for profitability is going to basically undermine humanity. I think at some point, you're going to have to find a, the, the right balance between profitability and humanity. At the moment, I'm, I'm seeing the tilting more towards profitability as opposed to humanity. And I think that's going to stay on for the next five to 10 years. And let's not forget also, if you listen to some of the pundits who have made pontification about how much is going to accrue from AI in the next 10 to 15 years, we're talking about 50 to $100 trillion worth of economic delta here. 50 to $100 trillion worth of economic delta. That's massive. And the biggest beneficiaries of this economic delta would actually be China and the US. Unfortunately, to a little extent, Europe, to a less extent, you know, the rest of, you know, the world, including us in Southeast Asia, much less sub-Saharan countries. We're going to be at most a user. Better than that, an enabler. We're not going to be a creator. China and the US will be creators. But I would argue that their being creators would be more technologically skewed as opposed to multidisciplinarily skewed. And that, I think, is a discount to our future. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're probably thinking about India, right? <laughs> <laughs> India and South Africa, I think, have been a bit different from the Singapores of the world, the Indonesians of the world. I think Indonesia and Singapore came out to condemn, right, uh, at the UN and also outside the UN. India took a different view. They basically came out some years ago with what I call or what they call this omnidirectional foreign policy, right, meaning they would look in an omnidirectional manner, seeking benefit, right? And that policy posture with respect to Russia was, well, if we can buy oil at 30% discount, why not? And I'll say whatever I have to say to get that. And they did that, right? And I think you know, quite similarly, South Africa did the same thing. I think what I, what I need to make a distinction between the global South today versus what the non-aligned movement that started out in Bandung, the South uh, the, the Asia Africa conference. That was the start of not just a non-aligned, but it kind of has evolved into free and active participation. You're basically free to choose, free to say whatever you want. And India, I think, has picked on that narrative. Now, more broadly, with respect to Ukraine, I'm not here to debate about whether, you know, one side is right, the other side is right. But let's think about the ultimate consequence, right? Whoever wins, is that country likely to win the peace? I mean, that I think is a far more fundamental question that needs to be answered, right? So I would pose that question to not just the Ukrainians, but also the Russians. Whatever you guys are after here, are you guys out there to win the peace or to win the war? I don't think we'll be able to get an affirmative answer, right? In the context of whoever wins. So there are divergent policy postures within the global south. One has take on, taken on a very much proactive omnidirectional policy, whereas others less so, if not much less so. I would categorize countries like Indonesia in a much less so category. Indonesia is not like India. Indonesia is not a good storyteller. Indians, they love to tell stories. I think one distinction you can make between China and India, China is visual, India is verbal, right? I would encourage many of my Indonesian friends to learn a little bit from the Indians. You know, the good stuff that they've done is that they know how to tell a story, right? And it's manifested in how the Indians are 
doing really well in so many different dimensions, right? Not just in Europe, but also in the US and also in Asia. Because they've invested massively in education and they've invested massively in telling their people to basically articulate. The Indonesians, unfortunately, we don't speak English as much as we should. If, if I were to guess, not more than 5 to 10% of the population would speak English. But I tell my friends at Stanford or anywhere I go, just watch. At a time when about 100 million people from Indonesia know how to speak English, I think you'll get a different flavor of Indonesia. Just watch when there is about 400 million people from Southeast Asia that can speak English. The narrative is going to be narrated in a whole lot different manner. At the moment, it's the Filipinos and the Singaporeans that are taking everybody's lunch, right? Because they're the English speaking people. So they've been able to basically tell the stories and they invested correctly in education, particularly using the English medium. So going back to your earlier Ukraine situation, I think it's about winning the peace and winning the peace, I think has something to do also with the ability to tell the story. Indonesians, Southeast Asians, broadly speaking, they're not credited commensurately for what they have done by way of maintaining peace and stability the way they have been in the last 2000 years. So will there be a moment of inflection, if not greatness in the future? I would like to think so, you know, but we got to take the long view. The long view would be that once we've invested enough for our people to basically be able to tell the story to ourselves and to the rest of the world, I think that's game time for us. Like in Taiwan, <laughs> for example, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in a camp that doesn't believe things are going to happen badly in Taiwan. I think the red line is clearly defined, right, by both sides. You know, ever since that famous conversation in 1971 between Kissinger and, you know, Mao and the people around him at that time, and Nixon in 1972, th there have been episodic stresses were tendencies to try to cross the red line. We saw that a, a while back when Pelosi, you know, went over to Taipei and made certain statements about, you know, what Taiwan ought to be doing. But at the end of the day, it's the economics, right? How do you, how do you justify creating some terrible situation when you don't have the wherewithal, the economic wherewithal, right? Let's, let's do the math here, right? $33.5 trillion, multiply that by 5%. How much is that? Okay, that's close to $2 trillion, right? $1.7 trillion per year. That's how much the American taxpayers need to shoulder. Right? You know, with that kind of money, how many donuts you can buy? You know, how, how easily you could get rid of the homeless in San Francisco? By the way, I was at the APEC summit three weeks ago. It's amazing when Xi Jinping arrived, there was no homelessness. <laughs> so we could use more visits by Xi Jinping to any, any place in the US. So I think at the end of the day, it's the economics. Now, do you foresee the American economy being able to shoulder paying interest amounting to 1.7 trillions a year for the next 10 years, right? And let's not forget, in 2025, half of all the treasuries are going to expire. So half of those $33.5 trillion are going to expire. At the moment, the, the weighted cost of average is about 2.5%. So they're going to have to be refinanced in 2025 at a much higher rate than 2.5%. So starting 2025, they're going to have to shoulder a much more costly. I, I think the people will speak up. 
you know, there is, I think, divergence between the representation and those represented. There is political neurosis, not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the world. I'm not going to mention countries. But that political neurosis, I think, will hit the wall when the economics will bite you. So I, I will rely on that. So in conclusion, I think over time, the United States will inevitably be able to learn a little bit more about multipolarity. I would argue that China, I think, has structural economic issues, right? I, I, I wasn't suggesting at all that the East was going to win out over the West on economics, right? Uh, if you take a look at the China's dual circulation economic philosophy that they embarked upon some years ago, it, it basically would entail a higher, if not a much higher degree of domestication of economic activities. Meaning, they would want the Chinese people to consume goods and services a lot more than ever before, right? So at the moment, right now, the ratio of domestic consumption to the GDP is about 55%. That ratio is going to go up. So on that basis, one would make the argument that the demand for goods and services made in China or by the Chinese will be so high by the Chinese. To the extent that it's going to be very difficult for you to get a hold of the Huawei's and the Oppo's and the Lenovo's, right? Because the Chinese will want them first, right? So what's going to happen consequently? Their current account is going to be exposed. They're not going to be able to collect foreign exchange as much as they have been in the past few decades. So as a result of their not being able to collect foreign exchange, their current account being exposed, they're not going to be able to be exporting capital as quickly, as well, as easily, as efficiently, as effectively as they have been the last decade or two. And this will bode not so well on what they call the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The Belt and Road Initiative was announced in 2013, right? On the back of this massive current account, right? They're, that they're going to be able to export capital. So if they run out of foreign exchange, they're not going to be able to export capital unless people in outside China will accept renminbi. But here's a catch. If you take a look at the swift cross-border transactions, the renminbi or the yuan does not occupy any more than 1.8% of the global transactions. Whereas today, the dollar still occupies about 44%, the euro 34%, then the yen, then the pound, and all the rest. But the Chinese yuan does not occupy any more than 1.8%. So it tells me that they're struggling to popularize the renminbi for international transaction purposes. So as much as that rhetoric upon the, the BRICS meeting some time ago that they're going to start de-dollarizing, they're going to start using renminbi a lot more, I think it's more rhetoric than, you know, substance on the ground. So I think the Belt and Road Initiative is exposed. And that will basically result in China's less ability to influence the rest of the world. So economically, they're now indebted in a big way. They're not going to be able to collect foreign exchange. Their current account is exposed. Capital account is exposed. They're not going to be able to export capital. So they're not going to be able to shape the rest of the world like we might have seen them in the last 20 years. So I think both the West and East have their own issues to deal with, right? The U.S. is also burdened with issues. So I'm not suggesting that the East is going to win out over the West, nor am I suggesting that the West is going to win out over the East. But I think the more anybody learns to, you know, win the peace better, I think the more we're going to see more peace, peace and stability for everybody. The politically correct answer is possible, right? 
possibly because I speak in front of the ambassador here who worked at the UN. <laughs> but the, 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 the politically incorrect answer would be, I think it's, it's going to be very, very difficult. Right? I mean, we, we, we've seen this in multiple settings, starting with the war on terror until recently in West Asia and also in Eastern Europe and also in Myanmar. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the great characteristics of the decline of multilateralism because of this revisionist tendencies by the middle powers that have been basically trying to rip the fabric apart from the pre-existing order that was driven by this unipolar world, that was driven by the United States. So as a result of all that, I think the role of the UN is going to be limited at a certain level. I'm not suggesting that they're not going to be useful at all. I think they're going to be useful for certain things, but I don't think they're going to be useful for large episodic stresses that affect humanity in parts of the world. So I'll stop right there before I get more wrong. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs>
right? So I think migration is going to be continuous with respect to the U.S. Uh, I don't foresee the Donald Trump presidency, if it ever were to happen, uh, affecting that adversely uh, in the U.S. Uh, we've, we've seen the data, people, the talents keep coming, you know, onto the U.S. Now, within Southeast Asia, uh, I think there's going to be a lot more talent coming from India and the Philippines to all over Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't think the Chinese will be coming to Southeast Asia from an AI standpoint uh, as much as what we might be seeing from India and, and the Philippines. Uh, not sure about Europe. I, I've always seen Europe as more of a hardware as opposed to software, right? This is where I think Europe could 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 learn from you know either China or the United States as to become more of a software uh, you know uh, place. Yeah. Inilah Endgame. What would it take for a nation to be great? I think it takes problem recognition. More structurally, what would it take for problem recognition? I think open-mindedness. In the absence of uh, full understanding of our history, history and the absence of competence, actual uh, accountability and integrity in political discussions, what are we left with?